Hello, BookTube. It's Friday, and that means Friday Reads here on BookTube. It's a snowy, stormy Friday here. Sleet and snow probably for the rest of the day. But the sun will come out. The snow's not going to accumulate. It's not catching on the ground at all. It's been happening for hours, and even on the grass that's within my sight, there's not the slightest brust, dusting of snow. So it's not. It's a stormy day in the air, but it's not an impact on life. Uh, and Friday is when a lot of booktubers take stock of the, the headlong rush of their reading momentum. I love it. I love watching those videos. I wish more people did it. But then again, booktube is infinite variety, so not everybody does a video that they will call a Friday Reads, but there are always recent reads, reading reports, reading updates. I love those sorts of things. Just love it. Because I'm uh, invested in these people that I'm watching on booktube. I'm invested in the stuff they're reading. I keep, I'm just a, I guess, a natural bookseller in that way, and that I keep a mental tab of what you're reading, and I want to know how you're dealing with it, how it's, you're getting along with it. Uh, and I thought I would do the same thing. I want to try to be faithful to the same thing pretty much every Friday this week, this year, if I can. So I've got a, a short list of books here that I either have read or have dipped my toe in a bit or I want to read. And the dip my toe in is not, I often, I often sort of tease the rest of you that I am never really working on a book. I, I understand that because a lot of you have no time to read, but I have all the time in the world to read. It's the only thing I do. So, especially on a day like today, <laughs> where my little bean is not at all interested in going outside. Uh, she's interested in looking outside. <laughs> she, she solidly looks out her window and sort of makes low-throated growling noises whenever anybody walks by who's walking wrong. <laughs> You're doing that wrong. <laughs> it's, it's tough being the queen. <laughs> but uh, but uh, when I read a book, I tend to read it in one sitting, is what I'm trying to say. So when I say I've dipped my toe in a book, it means I got an advanced copy of something, usually a work of history, and I want to gauge how serious it is. I mentioned in an earlier video, there are three levels to writing history or biography, really any kind of nonfiction. I would argue also three levels to reading any kind of fiction as well. But there's, are you super serious so that you are writing for a small coterie of select? Are you serious in that you are writing engagingly for everybody? Or are you dumb? <laughs> are you an idiot? In which case, you're you're not even writing. You're really just tub thumping for your own private purposes or for the purposes of the people paying your bills. I I dip my toe into books to see what that what they are, which of the houses of history they fall into, just so that later on when it comes time for me to actually engage with it, I can I can sort of know that. And plenty of books surprise me. My first impression is wrong, either positively or negatively. Uh, so some of these are like that, but we'll we'll go through them and see. A lot of them I haven't touched at all. This first one is one that I haven't touched at all. This is by Joel Wag Warner, and it is The Curse of the Marquis de Sade. <laughs> and this is a, another textual history. We saw a bunch of those last year, including, uh, what's his name, Hollis's book, The Wasteland, about the T.S. Eliot poem, that I ended up having a tremendously high opinion of, The Wasteland. That book. The, the uh, is that what it was called? I think it was called uh, is Matthew Hollis. Well, anyway. I'm sure you, you, some of you will remember the book. A lot of you are bigger Elliot fans than I am. Textual histories can be very interesting, and this is a textual history of the Marquis de Sade's grotesquely overrated book, 120 Days of Sodom, his, his part, but a little bit of pornography that has been elevated by lots and lots of people whose opinions I really respect. A lot of people really like it, uh, which I can understand. A lot of people also estimate it as being a serious work of literature. It certainly is not. Uh, but it had a very long and curious life, starting, of course, with being written in the Bastille. Not many books are written in the Bastille. Uh, but then it, it was, you know, ha had a Samitstad existence, you know, passing from hand to hand, being enjoyed uh, privately <laughs> quite a bit by quite a few people, and eventually getting to the point where nobody cares where you can find a second-hand copy of 120 Days of Sodom at your local Goodwill or Oxfam shop, take it to the counter, pay $2 for it, and no one anywhere along the line will even know what it is, much less care. Uh, that's the whole lifetime of a text, and that is fascinating. It's fascinating if an author, Joel Warner in this case, 
decides to dig in and trace the stories of that lifetime. And I gather that's what this is going to be. I think that's the original scroll of the book, but uh, I'm sure it will be fascinating to me. I do not need, whether it's Finnegan's Wake or uh, The Wasteland or Origin of Species or 120 Days of Sodom, I don't need to like the book to love a textual history of the book. If the author is doing a good job, then I don't need to like the book at all. Uh, this next one we saw already, I just didn't, I didn't feel like getting up and getting the, the, the ratty old paperback that I just found. I won't be reading the ebook. I'll be reading the paperback in honor of the, of the genre. This is Killer in the Rain by Raymond Chandler. This is a, the cover that I showed you yesterday, only minus the two used bookstore stickers. They, the, my paperback has those two stickers. This does not. This is a, a longer Raymond Chandler novel. I guess I'd have to ask Michael K. Vaughn, but I think this might be the longest book that he ever wrote. Uh, Chandler and I don't usually get along in his fiction. We don't usually get along, but uh, tastes change <laughs> as time goes on. We will see. Uh, then this next one is by Daniel Wiseman. I don't know if this is his debut or not. This is called The Last Songbird. Uh, and Okay, the basic outline of the plot of this is that there is a reclusive old retired pop singer, a legendary female songstress. Think uh, Carol King or Patsy Cline or Joni Mitchell. Think a, a towering, iconic figure like that who has had her golden time and is now living in a gigantic mansion on the Pacific Palisades. And through happenstance, that person develops a friendship with a Lyft driver to such an extent that they have an off-app relationship, which does happen. I had a Lyft driver once for a couple of years. That What that means is they like you like each other enough so that they want to call you. They want you specifically. They don't want to spin the wheel for a Lyft driver. They want you specifically, so they contact you. They don't go through the app to get you. They, they find out where you are when you're working. Uh, there are Lyft drivers who very much appreciate that. That can make you a good deal of extra money. But it's not money that, that is the case here. The, the Lyft driver in question is a guy, a Jewish man in his mid-30s, who used to have a musical gift. He used to be a songwriter. And they connect. It's pure happenstance the first time, but they connect. And they develop an odd driving friendship. Oftentimes, this person doesn't want to go anywhere. They just She just wants to drive up and down the Pacific Coast Highway and, and, and talk, and maybe reminisce a bit but she's not one of those type of retirees. She's not totally self-absorbed. And the, the sort of premise of the book is that she goes missing. And he doesn't know that she's gone missing. He shows up. She's called him for a lift ride one night. He shows up at her house, and the cops are already there. She's nowhere to be seen, and they don't immediately suspect him. Because, of course, why would he show up if he was involved he just gives them useful information about, you know, her last call to him or the people in her life or whatnot. And someone, a dead body is found at the house right away. Uh, so it is a crime scene. And then later in the book, she turns up dead. And he is the prime suspect. And he has to figure out some way to exonerate himself, the standard gimmick of, of thriller stories that would never in a million years happen. But... In the process of doing that, he also has to figure out who she was. He has to learn more about her life because he starts to suspect that in the last few weeks that they knew each other, she may have been hinting at trouble in her own life. And the police aren't interested. They're more interested in, in the, you know, the primary suspects that are right on hand. So he, it's really false to him to do the legwork. And, you know, you, okay, you listen to that as a premise. And you think, okay. I get it. I get this book. You can read it, of course. You're going to have to read every word of it. You're going to have to read all the way to the end if you're going to review it. But I get this book. And I thought that. But I don't know. Something about this book really surprised me. Didn't really start gaining strength until about a third of the way in. Right at the beginning, it feels like one of those the, these new thrillers that are hyper-caffeinated. The, the language is all jumpy. The characters are all cartoonishly pointed and whatnot. It didn't feel 
I didn't feel a great deal of our similitude at the beginning of the book. Of course, in a plot like this, you never would. But when the main character starts digging into her life story, what it was like to be a towering musical success as a woman in the 70s, something about the book just ignited for me. And it wasn't the same after that, even though it technically follows the formal dictates of this kind of a book. To me, it was never like that after that. It, it, I thought this was remarkable. I loved it, is what I'm trying to say. I, this is from Melville House. I think this comes out in May or maybe April. Uh, I think my Surly Houseboy opened this off camera for me to cheer me up while I was feeling horrible and he was doing a lot to cheer me up. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I will get a, a, a finished copy of this. And when I do, if I do, I'll show it to you in the flesh. But uh, uh, it was a winner. For me, it was one of the one of the first times so far in 2023 where a book not only surprised me, but really sort of filled me up. I, you know, like every other reader, that's why I'm reading. It doesn't matter that I'm sexier than you are. <laughs> in that sense, we are the same. <laughs> in precious few other senses, we are the same. I am basically unattainable. <laughs> But in that way, in that way, we are all the new people on the channel saying, who is this guy? <laughs> who does he think he is? <laughs> and all the old people on the channel are going, oh, Steve, you're not doing yourself any favors. <laughs> uh, what was I saying before? I... <laughs> oh, right. Uh, like it. I mean, I'm a critic and I'm, I'm a professional reviewer. So I'm looking at these things to a certain extent, the way a butcher looks at his meat delivery. But I, that is comparatively late window dressing. I'm in this for the same reason as anybody else, to be completely filled up with a book, to have the world go away for a book, to, to read a special thing. And this is one of the first experiences like that that I've had for 2023. So kudos to Melville House. Uh, sorry, sorry for long digression there. We'll go on to this one. We've seen this already. I got this, uh, a, a battered old trade paperback of this. I don't, I'm going to read the trade paperback, but I thought I'd show you the cover. This is Cornelius Ryan, who was a great historian of his day. Uh, largely forgotten now. He's in the Library of America, but he's he's not read anymore. Once upon a time, the longest day, a bridge too far. The, these things of his were common parlance. They were absolute stock and trade in bookstores. You if you were getting a book in a bookstore. You know you were for either your dad or your uncle or your grandfather, or if you were interested in history, you were going to get one of these things. And they're fantastic. They deserve that repute. They should be in print today. I don't know if The Longest Day or A Bridge Too Far actually is. But The Longest Day is about uh, the Battle of Berlin, the final battle in the West, where, uh, with forces advancing from three different sides of the city and diehard military holdouts in all of the major buildings, including the Chancellor Building, just uh, street by street, block by block, building by building fighting, and the logistics involved. You wouldn't think maybe that there would be much logistics if you've seen any photos of what Berlin looked like at the end of the war, but a big city is tough to take. Wall or no wall, moat or no moat, a big city is tough to take. A nightmare, a logistical nightmare to take, and Cornelius Ryan does this perfectly. So I'm, I'm going to take that trade paperback, the trade paperback that I found. I got it for free, so I'm not really concerned with it. And I have it as an e-copy, and I have it in the Library of America. Uh... But the trade paperback that I found is battered and beaten. It's been waterlogged. It's got stains all over it. So I'm going to read the hell out of it on the assumption that I'm just then going to give it an honorable burial in the backyard. <laughs> uh, but it's been a while since I read it. So, hey, baby. What you doing? How's the baby? <laughs> There's the little bean. Oh, <laughs> She really can't wake up when it's precipitating, and it is. It's sleeting and snowing. Uh, then this next one is for the gays. you got to have something for the gays. This is a novel, a serious novel, it looks like, uh, by Tom Crew called The New Life, uh, which is a historical novel set in Victorian England, I think, where uh, two men are working on a study of homosexuality. They're working on trying to elucidate it and trying to calm... Victorian fears about it, saying that it's it seems natural, it's it seems harmless, and it's it can be abusive and predatory and uh, necrotic like any other sexuality. But other than that, it doesn't seem to be any of those things inherently. And 
circling around the peripheries of the lives of those two men are actual homosexual encounters. Uh, and I don't know much more about it than that. I don't think I know this author at all. So uh, a serious historical novel? I mean, I read plenty of, of gay fiction that isn't serious, and I dearly love it. I'm not using serious here as any kind of implied pejorative for the reverse. But a, a big serious historical novel that deals with with homosexuality in C2 instead of anachronistically. So you were, what was it like then? That that would be great. I haven't read one of those in some time. Uh, then we have something. This is by Kathy Pelletier. Pelletier. This is Northeaster. This is the story of the blizzard of 1952 uh, here in the Northeast that really walloped the state of Maine, but it also walloped all of the Northeast. Boston was buried in snow in the blizzard of 52. It tends to be overshadowed uh, because of the blizzard of 78, which was another monster storm that hit New England. But, uh, the, there are, of course, photography was far more prevalent in 78 than in 52, so there are far, far more pictures of the blizzard of 78. Uh, news was far more international, far more national and international in 78. So stories about people dying, about people getting out of their cars and wandering to try to find the nearest gas station, the storm is so bad that they end up wandering in circles for two hours and freeze to death, 10 feet from the store and 10 feet from their car. Uh, stories like that from the Blizzard of 78 are far more common. But, so that's going to make this all the more interesting to me. What was this like? How I'm especially going to be interested in the state of meteorology in 52, which I, I don't know much about. I'm assuming that it wasn't all that advanced. And that therefore Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts had little in the way of advance warning of that the storm was coming at all, much less how bad it would be. But I don't think I've ever read an account of the Blizzard of 52, so... That'll be interesting. Then we have Eleanor Janega. This is the once and future sex going medieval on women's roles in society. I have seen this brooded about and talked about. I have no idea whether or not it's a historical study of women in the Middle, in middle Ages. Somehow doubt that. Uh, I, I'm going into it blind, in other words. I'm really hoping that it has a historical tinge to it and that it is not just modern gender study roles. Uh, because that would be excruciating. I would probably, I very rarely do this, but I would probably, if I if I get two chapters in and I realize that's what I'm in for, I probably just won't read this because there's no chance I'll review it and there's no chance I'll enjoy it. So, so there's no chance I'll agree with it. There's no chance I'll like it. So I, what would be the point? I, if I'll, I'll give it a try and we'll see. That is not a that is not a given at all. This next one, very much a given. <laughs> this this came to me when I was feeling really sick and really made me perk up a bit. This is One Duke Down by Anna Bennett. The main character in this book, you see the ocean in the background there, the main character in this book has a family fishing business. And we very much like to uh, preserve her family fishing business against any kind of setbacks, familial, financial, or otherwise. And her plans are complicated when her family fishing business nets a man <laughs> literally pulls a man into the net and he uh <laughs> he ends up being a duke and is immensely wealthy and it falls for her and may or may not be able to help her family situation i anna bennett's writing i just love her romance novels i think they're fantastic so very happy to get this i think this comes out in just a few days uh, so I'll put this, this is, this is on my Friday reads. My Friday reads like everybody else's Friday reads encompasses the weekend. Actually, everybody's, everybody else's Friday reads usually encompasses the whole week or the whole month. Uh, mine is, is the weekend, but this is right on the agenda. I actually got a, uh, a print copy of this. I just, I didn't go fetching any print copies for this Friday reads. Then we have Jesse Childs. This thing is getting some buzz. Very nice. Very good when that happens. I don't know about the book yet. I haven't read it yet, but uh, I always love it when a book gets a bit of top spin. Any, especially since it's a work of history, any inducement to get people to read history, and Buzz is an inducement, is okay by me. This is, this is the Siege of Loyalty House. This is one episode during the English Civil War, and it involves one house in Hampshire, one, one big house that belonged to one nobleman, that was you know, big. the big country piles of noblemen at that time in the reign of King Charles I were meant to withstand siege. They were fortifications as much as houses, not all of them, uh, but quite a few of them. 
were. And this house withstood a, she a siege for a long time. There's all sorts of bloody toings and froings, uh, all sorts of major personalities involved. I can't wait to see. I know this this incident really well, and I, and I have had all the appropriate guided tours when when in England. I and I I know the English Civil War really well, so I know the players on either side. But why Jesse Childs chooses to sit down on this event and what she chooses to write about it, that's going to be fascinating. Uh, that's going to be absolutely fascinating. I'm hoping that I get a, an actual physical copy of the Siege of Loyalty House. That would be nice. I, I don't particularly need it. I have, uh, you know, the, the PDF. The, so I've got all that I need, but I, I really like the finished copy of that one. And then this one, I will be getting a finished copy. This is by Reed Mittenbuehler, and this is Wanderlust. <laughs> we saw this on the channel already. This is a biography of Peter Freuchen, the, uh, the Danish explorer, uh, who led a, a rough, that's him, that's the gigantic grizzly bear on the cover there, he led a, a rough, adventurous life and was a, a big, interesting, larger-than-life guy. Like most polar explorers, uh, he didn't have all his oars in the water. <laughs> he doesn't take... There are, I think, a few archival old black-and-white interviews of him. It doesn't take more than watching a few seconds of any one of them to realize that. that they either don't have uh, all their sled dogs pulling in the same direction, if you know what I mean, to start with, or their first trip their first polar expedition does that to them and they're never the same after that. I have never encountered a biography. This is the first biography of this person I've ever read. I think, I, I still haven't nailed this down with Mark Richardson, but I'm pretty sure this is the first biography that Freakens ever got in English. But all the other polar biographies that I've read, they're, they're all a little touched in the head. I think maybe, I mean, one of the points that's made in Dan Simmons' great novel, The Terror, is that you'd almost have to be touched in the head to want to do this <laughs> back then to want to do this uh, maybe that's true but I, this is going to be utterly fascinating i'm sure so it's on my friday reads it, it's not uh coming up right away i got a just bound paper pages i didn't even get a galley copy i got just loose loose pages with a kinko's binding on it so this is probably months away this is probably February or, or you know March or May or something like that. I don't really know. I don't remember the date on it. The date didn't come on my very advanced copy, but I'm going to read it anyway because I want to read this a couple of times just to just to nail it down. Uh, so there you go. That is a Friday reads uh, to get back on track of making videos. Me and the Bean. <laughs> so uh, as usual with Friday reads, I of course want to know what you're working on. What you're reading or planning to read. That, that's always fascinating to me. Feel free to sing out in the comments field. Feel free to make a video. If you make videos on it, that would be wonderful. These things are really interesting to me. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.